Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Good evening. I'm Yvonne Stapp for Science for the Public, and I welcome you to Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations tonight. Tonight, we learn how exoplanets, uh, how astrophysicists locate them, and especially how they analyze exoatmospheres. Our guest to explain that is Mercedes Lopez Morales, an astrophysicist at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, and also this year a fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. Dr. Lopez Morales' research is focused on the development of new techniques to study the atmospheres of Earth-like planets. This is very challenging work, and she's here to explain what she and other astrophysicists have so far discovered. Dr. Lopez Morales was born in Spain and did her undergraduate work there. She received her PhD in astronomy from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, then was a Carnegie postdoctor postdoctoral fellow and Hubble fellow at the Carnegie Institution for Science in Washington, D.C., before returning to Spain as a researcher at the Spanish National Research Council's Institute of Space Sciences in Barcelona. In 2012, she joined the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, where she's been involved in several international exoplanet projects, including the ACCESS project, that's a, an acronym of which she's the principal investigator, and the upcoming NASA Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite called TESS. She will describe these missions tonight. It is a very special pleasure to welcome Mercedes Lopez Morales. Welcome, Dr. <laughs> Thank you, Rona. Thank you for inviting me, too. And I want to start by asking you to please explain what an atmosphere is. <coughs> an atmosphere is. Uh, an atmosphere is something that we wouldn't be here if it didn't exist, <laughs> basically. Um, uh, the basic definition is uh, you know, it's, a, it's an envelope of gas that surrounds most planets. Um, most of the planets in our solar system, except for maybe um, Mercury because it is too small. And then also we believe that most of the planets around other stars also have an atmosphere. Um, so far we don't have much information about those atmospheres, but that's, that's what we're working on right now. Exactly. Well, then if you have an atmosphere, what determines whether you can have an atmosphere on some body of, in space? Like, yeah, um, you know? uh, the main uh, thing I would say is uh, what the mass of the planet is. Um, and I'm talking for atmospheres later in the life of the planet. Okay. At the beginning, um, the atmospheres actually uh, form from the gas that is in the, uh, you know, in the original disk of dust and gas uh -huh. that where, where the planets form okay. from. And uh, somehow that gas, which is at the beginning is mainly hydrogen and helium, uh, you know, it, 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 it outgasses in the planet. And eventually all that gas gets lost in the okay. small planets like the Earth. If you look at a planet like Jupiter, it's so big that most of the atmosphere is hydrogen because the gravity of the planet keeps those uh, molecules, so they never go away. Uh -huh. But in the Earth, for example, most of the hydrogen has been lost, you know, unless it is trapped on methane or water or I these see. molecules. Um, so at, at the very beginning, I would say most planets have an atmosphere, and then as they evolve, you know, if they're small, they start losing the atmosphere. And um, uh, the, yeah, the, the atmosphere at the very beginning is mainly hydrogen and helium. Then the atmosphere gets lost. That's, that's what is called the primary atmosphere. And then you have a secondary atmosphere that comes from the outgassing of the planet due to uh, uh, volcanic eruptions and so on. Okay, so outgassing means it comes from inside yeah, the from planet the inside, and is yeah, emitted so, and yeah. then is trapped because of the gravity. Yeah, the, and then, okay. yeah, and then, but then at that at that stage, um, the composition of the atmosphere is already more sophisticated because uh, the 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 interior of the planet has had time to evolve and have other molecules more sophisticated like ammonia and methane and water vapor and so on. Okay. Um, 
so that's yeah so that's the, that's what we call the secondary atmosphere and then it just goes from there and you know evolves uh, evolves over time okay so on that you know, on an evolution of the of of an atmosphere so you get an atmosphere there are kind of two stages there one it grabs it from outer space one it's emitted from inside the the planet or whatever then something is going to happen to evolve so we were talking a little while ago that that if 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 you had looked at the Earth's atmosphere, you know, in the year two, when it was two billion years old yeah. or something, um, you would say, well, forget that place, yeah. right? So uh, it, it has changed radically. Uh, it, it, what changes, what causes the changes? The, the, uh, the uh, one example that we have right now is Earth, obviously. And um, we know, or our, well, we, we know from um, observations, and I will explain that a little bit later, uh -huh. we know that at the very beginning we didn't have a lot of oxygen floating right. around. And this is just based on, you know, study of rocks, uh, like, like ancient rocks that don't show a lot of oxygen. So the onset of, uh, like having a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere came with, uh, with the uh, beginning of sort of like life, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, phytoplankton in the, in the oceans started to absorb the carbon dioxide that was emitted by the volcanoes and it started to convert that into into molecular oxygen and um, and then you know at some point just because that production continues you get a, you get an atmosphere with oxygen mm -hmm. um, at the beginning as I was saying you know the oxygen was trapped in the water right. and the carbon dioxide but we didn't have oxygen floating around right and then at some point you know at, at some point what happened as well was that that oxygen was becoming mm. stable in the atmosphere and then we had uh, ultraviolet irradiation coming from the star that would dissociate those oxygen atoms into just uh, single oxygen atoms. And then those atoms would recombine with the ozone, right. I mean, with, with another, you know, atoms of oxygen, and, and uh, it would form ozone. So, and this happened maybe, uh, like within a billion years of the formation of the Earth, so then at, then at that point you also get an, an ozone layer that protects the surface from um, from the UV irradiation. That early, and we believe that you know at that point was when life is, could start to get out of the oceans because uh, you know at that point they could come out and the UV radiation wouldn't kill them. That's basically. very interesting. And that, so, so it made it possible to have ocean or uh, oxygen based life. Yeah, but, uh. but then, you know, at that point, uh, yeah, life is, is converting CO2 into oxygen, yeah, basically. Right, right. And, th and that's how the oxygen in the atmosphere keeps, keeps increasing. And that's, you know, eventually we make it a habitable planet. But at the beginning, probably no planet is habitable until right. life starts in the oceans somehow. If and you uh, don't get life, if you know if nothing does, if, for example, the atmosphere is much more, what shall I say, stable, I suppose, static uh, in other, on our other planets in our solar system, mm -hmm. for example. Earth has been very dynamic, yeah. but if you, are these other atmospheres, because there's no life, is, are they more static? I would say, um, yeah, definitely they, they, they would have a composition that probably evolves over time, but just because of scape yeah. of you know chemicals right. in the atmosphere, but it will not have a replenishment of, like say methane right. or oxygen. new gases don't yeah. develop. So or, that's yeah. yeah. So the atmosphere would definitely stay as it is for many many years, while in a planet with life on it, the atmosphere is more dynamic. And we say that the atmosphere is not in local thermodynamical equilibrium, uh -huh. and that basically means yes. that new um, gases are being produced yes, all the time. Right, it's right, right, it's over well, and yeah. especially. Um, is it important, before we leave that, do, do you have to have vapor, water vapor? Uh, 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 some of these exoplanets apparently have clouds. Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, clouds, so I think, funny. Yes, no, yeah. Actually, um, you know, again, we have to go back to the case of Earth because yeah. it's the one data point that yeah. we have now. Um, it is believed that uh, water was critical because when when the water like when 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 the outgassing of the uh, interior yeah. of the planet occurred, um, all this water vapor went into the atmosphere, yeah. and the water vapor got so dense that it started to rain out of the atmosphere literally, and that formed the oceans, and life started in the oceans. Right. So if that process hadn't happened, life as we know it wouldn't have emerged somehow. So. 
Yeah, well, water seems to be critical. It seems to be especially for if you're going to have a a a, a, a life planet. Uh, as far a life as we know, as we know yeah, it. As we know it, uh, exactly. Because at this point, I mean, again, yeah, you're we really only really <laughs> have one data point. So hopefully, I can come in ten years and tell you. And we say, have aha, uh -huh, the <laughs> silicon <laughs> life out there somewhere else <laughs> and, and stuff. Then okay, then. Now, you're in such an exciting era here where you're, first of all, nobody believed the people who were brave enough to go looking for exoplanets. Mm -hmm. I remember that very well. The poor things were just, you know, ridiculed. Um, now there are hundreds of these planets, and now you're on the frontier looking at the atmospheres, the exo-atmospheres. So can you tell us, like, uh, like, what, what, uh, how do you find them? That, first of all, how do you locate, I better say, how do you locate the exoplanets the planet first, first and then the yeah, exoatmospheres? There, there are um, many, many ways to detect the planets right now. And, you know, as you said, um, the hard times were made easier for my generation uh, uh, by people who tried to do this for many, many years. And one of the ways to detect the planet is to look at the wobble of the star that, okay. you know, you know uh, t nowadays you say this and everybody knows what you're talking about. It's basically the, the uh, gravitational interaction of the planet. So you see how the star moves and you can tell that there's a planet there. Okay. Uh, another technique which is coming, which is becoming really, really popular and actually is the one that we use for the atmospheres right now is a transiting technique. Can which yeah. is when the planet crosses in front of the star, you see this little dip in the amount of light coming from the star. And by the depth and the duration of that little drop, you know that it's a planet. Um, so that missions like the Kepler mission in the past five yeah. years have literally re uh, re revolutionized the, the field of exoplanets just by detecting transiting planets. So just having that uh, ability to observe that. Yeah. And uh, evident, did you have to have very exciting equipment in order to accomplish that? W well, the in transit? this case, yeah, the, you know, in this case, it, uh, we were we were doing these things from the ground, but it was going quite slow. Um, but then Kepler, that, you, know, it, you know, in that case, is this piece of very sophisticated equipment, which was this, you know, one meter telescope launched yeah. into space, um, just built to do this kind of science. Yeah. Um, you know, it took that specialization to detect the transits. Now, the one key thing here that may, uh, uh, people maybe don't realize is that. By detecting the transit, you only know the size of the planet, but you don't know how massive it is. You don't know. No, and the mass is important because yeah. it tells you how dense the planet is. And if you know the density, you know if it's a gas giant, you know, in which, you know, it would be just gas, so we wouldn't have a surface where life could right. develop. Right. Or if it is a rocky planet, right. where, you know, like Earth life could, you know, start and evolve and so on. So for that, you need to do follow-up of those planets, which, which at the beginning, they are just candidates. And then you do follow up with ground-based in, uh, instrumentation, which measure the wobble of, of, the, of the star because the planet is there. Yeah. And that's how you detect how you measure the mass of the planet. Oh, I see. And how you first confirm that it is a planet. And then you also know what the density is. And you can tell whether it is a rocky planet or, or, or a gas giant. That, that's how you do it. And both the, both the transiting technique and the uh, wobble technique, right. I mean, they require really precise um, instrumentation to do those kind of observations. We'll come back yes. to that, because yeah, I think this is definitely. something that you work on quite a bit is, uh, the, yeah, uh, it, it, with this. Uh, so you then you have these ways of kind of collecting this data and then analyzing it, and you can really be quite sure you can talk about the mass and which is amazing considering they're so remote and yeah. and little compared to the stars I, uh, so that's that's quite say, that's quite something so can we go to these ground based telescopes you use uh, a lot i think for checking this out uh, one thing i'd like to insert in that is that we understand that um, astro astronomy data is just enormous, right? <laughs> and I don't know how you select the select out from droves of data how to look at things, yeah, but we have, um, could you tell us anything yeah, like about our, it? Our selection actually starts in the planets that we want to look at. Um, and we basically look at, I mean, we choose the ones for which we think we, we 
you know, it will be easier to detect the atmospheres. So right now, with the technique, with the instrumentation and the techniques that we have, we can look at the atmospheres of Jupiter's. Mm -hmm. We're starting to see the atmospheres of what we call Super Earth, which is which is a type of planet that does not exist in the solar system mm -hmm. because the mass is be is in between the mass of Earth and the mass of Neptune. Mm -hmm. But it turns out that based on the Kepler results, they seem to be the most abundant planets. I've heard in, that, you know, yeah. at least in the galaxy. Yeah. So we are now getting down to Super Earth to yeah. be able to de to actually detect the atmosphere, and um, and yeah. So basically, we choose the planets that we think uh, that it's going to be easier to detect the atmospheres. And obviously, they have to be uh, interesting from the, from the science uh, point of view. And then uh, we just put together these you know, international collaborations to get enough telescope time uh, to observe you know, a set of planets and try to detect the atmospheres. And you know, basically try to tell you what the chemical compositions of the atmospheres are. Yes. And, uh, and sort of you know, to, to start putting together a sample of you know atmospheric measurements that you know in some sense they not only tell you about the physics of the planet itself, but it puts our solar system in context. Ah, thinking ahead of time and thinking yeah. how similar is our solar system or the planets in our solar system to most of the planets out there. Um, so that's that's what we are trying to do now. Um, it is, it is taking quite a bit of work, but... A, a bit, you know, I'm we, sure, we are a bit, a, exactly. Oh, a, a couple of things. First, can we go back to that, the, the, the uh, uh, super planet thing? Um, I, I, I read this, that uh, that seems to be very abundant, and we don't have we don't it have in our it. solar system. Yeah. So what's weird about our solar system that uh, we don't have that? Or is it because this is what you can perceive at this time? No, I think it's, well, you know, if uh, we, we also can measure uh, the dips, you know, the transits of things that seem to be the same size as Earth. Ah, uh, OK. Um, so. We don't know what, why those planets exist, but whatever the physics is behind it, I mean, they are easy to form. Mm -hmm. And why we don't have a super Earth in the solar system, the answer right now is we don't know. Um, you know, it could depend on, at the beginning, you only have so much mass in the uh, disk of mm -hmm, gas mm -hmm, from mm -hmm, where the planets mm -hmm. form, and most of that material went into Jupiter, and whatever was left went into the other planets. So maybe um, the mass from what could have been a you know, super Earth in our solar system went into Mercury, Venus, and Earth and Mars instead of forming just one planet. But we don't know exactly why. Um, so you know, it's, it's open to. Yeah, right. That's something to be worked out in time, yeah. I guess. Yeah, it's an open uh, problem right now, like many others. So, you know, uh, it seems yeah. like every time we look up into the sky, we find something that. You know, it's not what we expected. Yeah, which is part of the beauty of. Well, know, I would think so. It would be a very exciting job, actually, because yeah. <laughs> everything is yes. unknown. But can you tell us now about the atmospheres that you are identifying? What What are you finding? Yeah, um, as I was saying, right now we're um, we have been doing this for about uh, seven years or so. Uh, the first atmosphere was actually detected by somebody here at the CFA, ah. Dave Charbonneau, in two thousand and two. Oh. And that was done with the Hubble Space Telescope. But then luckily enough, the instrument that he used broke right after. Oh, for goodness so sake. So the field you know, slowed down by a few years. And then um, a new space telescope came up that they launched to actually do something else, to do infrared astronomy. And they realized that they could use that to detect the atmospheres of planets as well. And that was uh, the name of the instrument is uh, Spitzer. Yes. And uh, Spitzer uh, was launched in 2003. And it worked for a few years. Um, I think, it, uh, yeah, it is still working, but now it's, it's you know, it's working not not as well. But that basically revolutionized the detection of atmospheres from from space, uh, starting in two thousand and five. And and then we realized that this could be done from the ground as well, because you know it's also cheaper to use instrumentation in the ground than, you know, to convince NASA to send you know. Uh, um, you know, satellite out there to do these kind of things. Uh, so we have been doing it from the ground since 2009. And um, at the beginning, we just focused on, you know, the, the big planets, the Jupiters, because they were the easiest one to, mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. detect. And basically what we do is uh, we use a transit uh, technique. 
which what happens is um, when the planet crosses in front mm -hmm. of the star, part of the light from the star goes through the atmosphere the of the filter. planet. Yeah, and then, yeah, it acts like a filter. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it filters the light at the wavelength where, like, mm -hmm. b basically you lose the light at the wavelengths where the molecules in the, in the atmosphere of the planet interact with the photons. So you can absolutely distinguish what you're seeing, it, it, like the, the radiation from the star yeah. and the atmosphere of a planet. Yeah, so basically what we do is um, to distinguish one from the other. Yeah. We observe the system from, if that is a star, from when right. the planet is out here. Yeah. We start observing. So yeah. there we only see the light coming from the star. Right, I see. And then when it gets here, we yeah. see the light coming from the star plus the light going through the atmosphere. Got it. And then we keep observing on the other side, like after the planet gets out. Right. And then what we do is we subtract the light from the parts of the observation that where the planet is outside of the surface of the star from the parts of the observation where the planet is going through. Yeah. And what is left is whatever went through the atmosphere. And that's how, at, you know, at the end, you basically get a spectrum that shows you absorption lines at the wavelengths of the chemical elements that are in the atmosphere of the planet. Is this spectroscopy? It's, yeah, it's spectroscopy. So it's the same thing you would look at with a radiant star or something. Yeah, okay. yeah. so you basically, but you, and see, you see the lines. The lines and, from uh, the star, yeah. the, the, the spectral lines from the star, right. you subtract them out. And right. you're left with only the lines from the planet. But it, it's, it's the same thing. It's which are same, tiny, yeah. which are tiny. It's like, well, just, just to give you an idea, mm -hmm. um, of all the light coming from the surface of the star, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if you have, say, a million photons, maybe mm -hmm. one or ten photons go through the atmosphere of the oh, planet. Oh, 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 So I that's see. how small the yeah. signals are. And uh, so that's, that's what makes it complicated, you know, to make the instruments really, really sensitive to the, this kind of really small detections. But the, the, um, the technique itself, I mean, it's, it's quite easy, you know, you just, you just look at the light that filters through the atmosphere, but right. it's the size of the signal that is so complicated. I mean, it's one part in a hundred thousand, sometimes one part in a million that gets absorbed. And, um, but we, we, are, we are learning how to do it. Yes. And, uh, we have, for Jupiter's, uh, you know, in between this, this access project that I have and many, many other um, groups around the world, we have observed already the atmospheres of about uh, 20 Jupiters. And the one thing that we're finding is, guess what? Clouds. Like, Jupiters have clouds, which is... Does our Jupiter have clouds? Yeah, so, okay. so you, you know, you know it, it, it shouldn't be surprising for us because you look at the planets in the solar system and they have clouds. Yes, right. But right. from the science point of view, it's a bummer because <laughs> you can't see anything, like, under the cloud. Oh, oh, I so see. It's I see. Like so it'd be like looking at the yeah, Venus it's, it's or something. Blocking. That, yeah, 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 yeah. It would be yeah, exactly the same thing yeah. as if you looked at Venus. Right. And just because of the clouds are right, so you thick, can't see below. you can't see through. Uh, so that's the problem that we're finding. Um, on the other hand, we're learning that the planets have clouds. Uh, they're not necessarily water clouds. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because, and we know this because the planets that we're looking at are really hot. I mean, they are about oh, yeah. 1,000 Kelvin, 2,000 Kelvin. So water shouldn't be in, shouldn't mm. be able to condense, you know, at those temperatures. Right. Um, so we haven't figured out what the clouds are made of. Uh, but we know that there's something there that is blocking the light. And we can't see anything. Why are they hot? They're so hot. Because, yeah, be because the planets that we're looking at are really close to the, okay. to the star. So they get heavily irradiated. And so the temperatures are usually um, you know, a factor of 10 times hotter than right. our Jupiter. Right. And, um, is it harder to, s it obviously be harder to see smaller planets, but it doesn't, you can't deduce that if there's this big planet that there will be other ones, right? Yeah. You, it's you basically too hard to catch that with the transit or whatever. No, no, you if can. they're there, you see them. Uh, the, 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 the only problem that we have is that, like these tiny signals that, we are, that I'm telling you about, as the planet gets smaller, the atmosphere gets smaller, so it is harder to detect. So if for a Jupiter you're seeing one part in 10,000 yeah. absorption in the atmosphere, oh, for an right. Earth you're seeing one part in a million. Yeah. 
So what we are doing is we are developing techniques, like the techniques are all the same. So we are working hard with the easy ones to right. improve the techniques until we can measure the small ones. And so far, uh, luckily for us, we don't have a small planet yet to look at. Right, uh, but you're but ready. Missions like TESS, uh, which is a NASA mission that you mentioned yes, at the beginning, right, right. Uh, are going to be flying in a few years. So they are going to provide the candidates, and then we will be ready to, to look at them as, as a holiday. So in principle, if you can do it with the large planets, then you can. Yeah. You, well, you're, if you know you're, how to do it with a large you planet, find the small the one, you can do it. Same, so even though that's so little data, so to speak, coming yeah. through, that's quite amazing that you can catch it. Well, let's go to what you're doing. So you have, we talked about the access, which you can explain yeah. to us, and, and, and tests is forthcoming and stuff. But I'd like to know also about, you use these big telescopes and so on. Um, Tell us about that and your projects, okay? Yeah, we have, uh, well, Access is this uh, international collaboration with, um, it is 10 of us. Um, we have people from the University of Arizona, uh, mm -hmm. the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, uh, Universidad Católica in Chile. Uh. And, and uh, then we have people in Germany, people in California, Maryland, and uh, Chileans we have in two places. And uh, the whole idea of this project is to get a set of about 30 planets with all kind of sizes, like from Jupiter's to super Earth, because we haven't found an Earth yet, and try to characterize the atmospheres of all those I planets. I see. And um, yeah, the reason why we need this kind of international collaboration is, well, to begin with expertise. I mean, you know, like people who know how to do this are in different parts of the world. Mm -hmm then uh, access to telescope time. Like, for example, the Chileans are a very important part mm. of the collaboration because the telescopes are in Chile. And uh, so they immediately get access to the telescope, or not oh, immediately, but priority. It, is, it is easier for them to get access yeah. to the telescopes right. than for us. Right. Um, so all together we can put you know, enough telescope time to, to complete the uh, project. And, uh, the main result from access right now is what I was telling you before. It's like we're seeing a lot of clouds everywhere. But we're learning. We're learning how to do this. And I think that we are you know, um, uh, in very good shape. Um, th this is the project that, that you know, I'm working on now. But then when we actually finally find the, the Earth with um, you know, an Earth twin, I would say, uh, with a mission like TESS, which is, is, you know, is, a, is a fully funded NASA mission, mm -hmm. uh, which is going to be launched in 2017, if everything goes well. And uh, it's going to map the entire sky uh, with portions of the sky, uh, actually mapping them every two months. And it's going to look for these little tiny transits. But it's going to be so sensitive that it will be able to tell us you know, if there is an Earth-like planet there. And uh, so at that point, uh, based on the results from TESS, we, we, we will have our candidate list. You know, we, we will have our favorite targets. And we will go into the next generation of telescopes because the telescopes that we have right now, they can do Jupiters. They can do some of the super-Earth, but they cannot do the smaller planets. Okay, you mean these Earth-based uh, telescopes, as powerful as they are, are right. limited in right terms now, of where you're headed? Right now, the biggest telescopes that we have uh, are 10 meter plus telescopes. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's, you know, the, the 10 meter is the size of the primary mirror. Mm -hmm. The next generation of uh, ground-based telescopes is going to be from 25 all the way up to 40 meter mirrors. Mm -hmm. And those are going to be able to collect in a flight for us to do this kind of science with planets like Earth. Um, we will also have, hopefully, the uh, James Webb, uh, Webb Space Telescope, um, which the advantage of that one is that you put it outside of the Earth atmosphere, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which introduces a lot of noise. I mean, our atmosphere, you know, it helps us live, but for my job, it's, it's just a pain I was, that is yeah, in the way. Right, right. And uh, so James Webb is going to be able to do this as well. Right. But the problem is that it's only one telescope, and there's going to be many, many targets. Right. So you need more telescopes to do this. And um, uh, with the tests, that's a, a 
of, that's out of the Earth's atmosphere also. And then the web, yeah. which everybody's been waiting for. Yeah. Um, they're mm -hmm. a close in time, I guess, in, for being launched. But they're doing different things. Is that correct? Yeah, but uh, they will give you data. But yeah, TESS test will find the candidates. I see. You know, TESS will find the Earth. Uh, then James Webb, um, is, you know, it's a multi-purpose telescope. I uh, see. You know, people will do from exoplanets to cosmology, uh, but for the part of exoplanets, it will be able to really look at the atmospheres of these tiny planets that TESS provides. Right. And tell you, you know, if they contain the the ingredients for life, uh, or that, that we know are right. the biomarkers of life. I mean, exactly. they tell you that there should be life there. Right. Um, That's amazing. This is within 20 years. You're going to have some big answers, This aren't you? is within 10 years. Um, Do you think 10 yeah. years they will even, well, because you're so well prepared uh, for, for this? Uh, it's, you know, I'm, I, I am sure that we will find a lot of problems, um, but I, I really hope that within 10 years we will be able to, because TESS is going to provide the candidates within yeah the next five or six years. Right, that's then, amazing. Then, you know, yeah. it might take us like two or three years to actually learn how to do this well. So that puts us like eight, nine, yeah. uh, eight, nine, ten years away from now. So we will be able to do this from space. From the ground, the new telescopes are going to take another ten years to come online. Uh, so so they're, are they under construction now? Is this like by Keck or and all we that? Have, or um, we have three telescopes, two are American telescopes, mostly American, and the other one is a European telescope. Uh, the European is a 39 meter in diameter uh, telescope, and uh, 39 meters. 39 meters. Uh, I cannot even imagine. <laughs> I, I'm size. just thinking <laughs> that how you know all the difficulties with those big mirrors. There's those yeah, it's so bigger than my house. <laughs> I, I think it's <laughs> just <laughs> amazing. Yes. And, uh, so uh, that one is is um, is a collaboration between all the European countries. Right. And then okay. on the American side, we have the uh, Giant Magellan Telescope, which is a collaboration between uh, the current institution of Washington, the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, and you know other um, uh, institutions in the U.S. And then also we have uh, international collaborations like that. That I remember now we have uh, uh, Australia and so on. And then the the third one is called the 30 meter telescope. That's the name, so I don't have to explain what the size is. And uh, that one is going to go in Hawaii. And uh, I ha my understanding is that uh, uni uh, the uh, universities in California are involved, and, but I, I honestly don't know much more about that project. But those, uh, those three telescopes are going to revolutionize, uh, you know, at least the field of exoplanets uh, when they go online. Um, but that is going to take about 10 years. Mm -hmm. so. so in another decade or so, it's just, it seems like so many miserable things are happening <laughs> to the Earth. But this is a nice kind of upbeat uh, yeah. thing. Uh, it, you couldn't have hit a better period of time, could no, you? It's amazing. No, to uh, you know, at the same time, my, my feeling is that, um, yes, we are there at the right time, but we also make our time. Like, you know, now we are at mm -hmm. the right time to study mm -hmm. atmospheres mm -hmm. because starting 30, 30 years ago, these people started looking forward, uh, working on how do we find the planet. So, yeah, it is good timing, but, you know, still it's going to take a lot of work. Yeah, and, yeah it's, to, it's to, to quite this. interesting, yes. So there are these technological advances are going to open up a, a, a whole realm there. Are there any particular challenges that are like overwhelming? <laughs> yeah, right now uh, we are trying to figure out how to model out of our data the Earth atmosphere. Uh, because the main problem that we have, so, so the, uh, the holy grail in this yeah. field is to find the next, the next Earth twin. But because, because that planet is a twin of Earth, the atmosphere is going to look identical to ours. Or, or so we hope. Yeah, yeah. So then, if you try to do this from the ground, you have our uh, our atmosphere in between. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we do spend a lot of time on thinking on, you know, how to how to remove the effects of our atmosphere, and we are developing some techniques that uh, are looking really, really promising. Um, 
but we just have to wait and see if they work. And then uh, if they don't work, we can always go to space with James Webb mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, try, to, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. try to do the atmosphere from, the, from there. So. But there, the, there is a downside with using the, the Earth the telescopes Earth, yeah. for all the good stuff that, yeah, that's involved there. Yeah, it's a trade-off because yeah. you know, um, uh, in the ground, you can actually build bigger telescopes. Mm -hmm. And a telescope is just a bucket that collects mm -hmm. photos for you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the bigger the bucket is, the more signal you have and the easier it is to detect these atmospheres. But at the same time, you have the Earth atmosphere in between. Um, if you go to space, the telescope is smaller. Yes. But you don't have the Earth atmosphere, so it's a little bit easier. Yeah. So it is a trade-off. Right. Um, at the end of the day, you know, I think that we need to do the ground-based stuff because uh, the resources are larger. I mean, mm -hmm. we will have many telescopes to do this, while in space, at least in the next two or three decades, we are going to have one telescope to do this. And um, yeah, and, o and also the apertures are so much bigger that we, uh, what we need to do is to figure out how to get rid of the Earth atmosphere somehow. Yeah, you know, right, you know what they right, do, right. The, the And the rest of us are working on how to clean it up too yeah, at the same yeah, yeah. time, though, which but is going you to be know, a problem. I, yeah, I right? have my <laughs> that could be a problem I do down have the line. <laughs> no, but actually, if you clean it up for us, that's, that's great. That's, oh, <laughs> right. oh, that's that committee to do yeah. that. Okay, right. I'd like to ask you about the international aspect of this. It seems like a lot of science is headed toward big collaborations. Yeah. What generates that? What motivates um, that? Um, there, there are several reasons for this. Um, one of them is knowledge. You know, the knowledge yeah. does not sit in one country. But you have experts in many countries mm -hmm. that if you put those experts together, your chances of success are much higher. Mm -hmm. um, another reason is funding. I mm -hmm. mean, you obviously, you can get funding from many places and you can build a bigger project that, than you know, if you only have funding from, uh, from one place. And another reason, although a little bit less important, but, f uh, but from the science point of view, is actually critical, is that... Uh, if you have many, many people working on one project, they can double check each other's results because we don't want to make a mistake. You know, you don't want to publish something out there that is totally wrong. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and that's where also the collaboration mm -hmm, comes mm -hmm. from. You know, you check my results, I check your results, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we make sure that, you know, everything is correct. So, um, but in science, uh, international collaborations are actually quite common. Yes, and, and uh, increasingly global yeah, and with yeah. like uh, yeah. 500 names to every <laughs> yeah. big paper and stuff. But it seems to me that it, it that just subjectively, that it offers opportunities for many nations to participate, yeah. many institutions to participate, which is altogether healthier. And in some of these things, like the joke at CERN, for example, with the Large Hadron Collider, is that mortal enemies are able to work together. You know, <laughs> could we try yeah. it nationally now? But that people get beyond these border yeah. things altogether, yeah. and the world is getting much more At the more same global. time, you know, I Collaborations are good uh, just because of many, many mm -hmm. reasons, as, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. as I was mm -hmm. trying to explain. But you also have to have competition. Mm -hmm. you know, not everybody can work together. True. Because then <laughs> the, the ideas go only one way. Yes. Okay. Um, so, yeah, like, at, you know, at least, at least in our field, it is tending towards we have maybe like three different groups that don't work together. Each one of those groups is a, you know, it's an international collaboration on itself, mm -hmm. but we just check each other's results, yeah, but in right. a very critical way. Yeah, and, right. You know, it also allows not quite war <laughs> diversity. <laughs> yes, ah, right. It can get ugly, you know. Oh, it's well. like, it can get ugly sometimes, but yeah. but I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, you know, it's a healthy competition. That's the way well, I look at it. Well, and it's inevitable, I'm sure. You can't. And it's an, it's an you important can't avoid thing. It, yeah. right, and actually, um, the good thing about this is that what people maybe don't realize, and like I myself didn't realize when I was younger, is that competition is good mm -hmm. because that's how we make progress. Mm -hmm. You know, if everybody's happy with your cup of tea, they will never make a better cup of tea. Right. So um, right. competition is good. Right. As long as it is healthy, competition. <laughs> Just healthy. Yeah. Right. And another thing, what about funding? Is 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 there a will, a global will to fund this sort of thing? Do you, uh, you have all kind of um, 
uh, mentalities around the world. Uh, some countries like Germany, for example, I mean, it's very clear to them that they have to put money into mm -hmm, science. Mm -hmm. Although you probably go and talk to a German person and they will tell you that they don't have enough. But, you know, a country like the U.S., uh, there is, uh, like, you know, a general mentality that science is good, mm -hmm. but it's not as generalized as, you know, as it could be. Yes, um, we've noticed, yes. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so, you know, it could be even better. I mean, we're, we're, mm -hmm. we're in a very strong position, but I cannot even imagine how much better we would be if, you know, people were more committed towards giving funding to, to exactly. science. Exactly, so or understood the yeah, significance yeah, and, uh, of that. Yeah. At the end of the day, you know, it's like, you know I, can, I can speak for my own little field, uh, but you know the search for exoplanets is just a droplet in a mm -hmm. you know in an ocean on the you know amount of like things that you get out of science and things that actually help you know humanity as a whole to move forward. Uh, you know I can just think of like the cure for cancer, mm -hmm. you know like, which has nothing to do with what I do. But if we put more money into that, eventually right. we will find it. Exactly. And uh, so in general, you know. Yeah, I think uh, we we do struggle with funding. I mean, right now, you know, in the in the current economy, I guess that every single person can come and tell you that they are struggling with funding. And right. So are we. I mean, we right, are, right, we right. Are special in that yeah, sense. it depends. I guess it depends. On the, it seems as though actually, the world is awash in money, but it's <laughs> it's just concentrated maybe in the, it's wrong, in the wrong places, places. <laughs> or something. Exactly. It's in the wrong places. Before we leave this, uh, uh, I would like to ask, what do you think in terms of the prospects for finding life elsewhere? There are people who say it's not out there, yeah. period. We're not going to find life. This is the only place and uh, uh, so uh, on. What do you think? I, I beg to disagree with that mm -hmm. because um, I mean, we, we cannot talk about intelligent life. I mean, I'm not thinking about this little alien watching sure TV, which here, is going to you you know, send us a radio <laughs> signal and say, hey, yeah. I'm here. Right, right. But bacterial life is life. Yeah. And um, we can actually find a planet like the Earth, meaning like habitable, at many, many stages mm -hmm. throughout the evolution of Earth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, any form of life is life. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't have to be intelligent life. Right. So the chances of bacteria or, you know, any, any kind of life developing elsewhere in the universe, I would say are 100%. Okay. Now, so you're very optimistic. You're waiting yeah, for yeah, the... Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just waiting to see. And, uh, and then, you know, at the same time, I'm trying to be really humble and think we really, re we really need to learn what, we, what to expect because right now we only know how life on Earth is. Mm -hmm. We only know uh, what the biosignatures, as we call it, mm -hmm. of a planet like Earth are going to be. Right. Like basically, we know that you know it's going to be oxygen, yeah. it's going to be methane, it's going to be carbon dioxide, but we don't know what those biomarkers are going to be for different exactly. types of life in different exactly. countries. Exactly. So. Uh, my feeling is that we're going to be learning a lot mm -hmm. and we really have to keep an open mind because we are going to be seeing signals uh, I I you know in this data that we take that we will probably we will not be smart enough to identify as good point as yes. life yes and, uh, but you know maybe the kids nowadays you know like just give them 30 years yeah and they they will be able to figure out oh you know there's really? also it's just amazing. This has all accelerated so much in a few decades, yeah. really. Yeah. And uh, when you think about it, it wasn't that terribly long ago when they were still talking about the Earth as the center of the universe. There yeah. were no galaxies and so on. You know, it's, it's amazing how much Guess we, what? It's not. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like, well, there are a few people right yeah. here that are still maintaining yeah. that, <laughs> that the other, but in any case, before we leave, before I turn you over to the audience, uh, let them talk to you, I'd like to get a little bit of background, if you don't okay. mind. Uh, how did you get into this field? Did you just grow up this way? It or? was, no. <laughs> it was a little bit by accident, really, because, um, you know, I always liked math since I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. And uh, at some point in my, in my life, I wanted to be an English interpreter. And, oh, then, and then I realized that I had to take like Latin and Greek and it's like, Forget I don't like that. that. Right, okay. so, um, so I went into science. 
uh, but then I was more attracted towards the engineering side. Mm -hmm. So I started building robotic telescopes. Oh, for Just these little robots sake. that just do the whole yes. thing for you. And then somehow I, you know, I ended up in Carnegie where they worked on exoplanets and they just, it just caught my, my attention. And, um, and then from that point, you know, it only takes uh, like a little bit of thinking and, you know, just, I don't know, I don't even know how to say this in English, but it's like, you know, the desire to learn yeah, something new. right. And to explore and so right. on. So, it was kind of an infection, uh, yeah. intellectual infection. <laughs> but then, yeah. you know, at the same time, and this might sound like really philosophical, but, you know, you only live once. Yes. And, yes. you know, everybody has to find a purpose, yes. you know, for life. Right, so my right. purpose is going to try to be, uh, you know, it's going to be to try to find another planet like Earth. You're exactly. And I might not the, get the it. purpose. <laughs> I might not get it, but in the meantime, you know, that's what I'm working towards. Yeah. And, uh, but it's very interesting that you didn't start out with that sort yeah, of thing no, in no, mind at uh, all, and that no. you were more interested in, the, say, the technical, the engineering yeah, end. Yeah. And was that in your postdoc that you discovered yeah, this? Actually, Isn't that yeah, actually, yeah. I did, a, I, I, I did my PhD thesis on robotic instrumentation. Oh, for goodness and, sake. Uh, and also, I had to have a little bit of science. Yeah. So I was working on uh, stars, like the basic properties, like the size yeah, and yeah. the mass yeah. of stars that are smaller, uh, are smaller than the sun, which we call M dwarfs. And uh, it so happens that over time, now we think that those are the most um, like the, the best places to look for planets like That's Earth. So they say. So yeah. it just you know it just came together yes. somehow. Isn't yes. that so something? The uh, techniques to analyze the data are all the same, and that's you know it just it the rest is history. The, the rest is here we are. <laughs> so well, together. you yeah yeah, and you moved very quickly with it too. Yeah, it's, you have it's, to. it's true. Yeah. I hope that you have a wonderful year at the Radcliffe. Uh, and you. as you already mentioned, since it's right down the street from your workplace at the Center for Astrophysics, sometimes you're not as away as some <laughs> of the so lucky true. fellows yes. are at the Radcliffe when they do their fellows year. But in any case, I hope you have a wonderful time there and that we really appreciate your coming and nice, pleasure. telling us all about this. I will now step out of the way here and allow you to go ahead and talk with the audience, okay? okay? Be very, uh, quite familiar with the star catalog in the late 70s. Oh, yeah. That was before Hubble, mm -hmm. uh, when I was designing uh, star, star sensors for the defense uh, satellites. How, complica how complex is now the catalog and how many stars are there now after the Hubble? I don't think, um, you know, a lot of the Hubble work has been on galaxies. Uh, the stars that we knew at the time are still the same uh, because we only go so far and they are just, you know, stars in our galaxy. So I don't think the catalog has changed a lot. Uh, it's, more, it's more the catalog of galaxies has grown a lot. But the star catalog, you know, I bet that you go back to it and, and it, looks, it looks pretty much the same. Except that now I'm thinking, except for brown dwarfs which are not stars in our solar uh, you know in uh, in our solar neighborhood um, they have found quite a few new ones and they still think that there are more than 100 missing but otherwise you know the actual star catalog hasn't changed much so. uh, th these new super telescopes that they're building uh, is that going to be a single large mirror or a, a bunch of little mirrors put together? No, no, it has to be a bunch of little mirrors because um, with the current technology, you can always, the biggest mirror that you can build is about 10 meters. Uh, otherwise, you know, they start flexing and so yeah, it has to be several. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, early in your talk, you made a remark that puzzled me. You said that the water of the earth came from outgassing. Yeah. Isn't there a controversy about that? Isn't there a possibility that it came from exoplanets or exocomets? Yeah, well, actually, um, there, there, there is a belief. Like, the problem with the, this, this controversy is that you cannot, you cannot produce enough water for, to, to, to account for the water There's that we have in our oceans. Here. We do agree. Yeah. And then, so right now, like, you know, another theory is that the water comes from comets that impacted in the. Um, like with the Earth, like very early on, um, that is still possible. I mean, we have this this new comet now, P sixty four, sixty seven, and you know it seems to have water. Um, so yeah, that's that's a possibility. So the outgassing theory is for the the atmosphere. 
So yes. the, the water vapor gets in the atmosphere from the eruptions of volcanoes and so on. Then the the water from the comet is not clear to me. Like it, it you know it really well, depends at what the point. Has reformed, do we? Yeah, yeah. It really depends at what point during the formation of Earth the comet actually hit the Earth. So well, I wasn't there at the time. At the <laughs> I wasn't there either. Mm. <laughs> I wish. Yeah. <laughs> I have two questions. First one, which molecules have so far been detected or confirmed in exo-atmosphere, atmosplanet atmospheres? Yeah. And then the second question, you mentioned biosignature molecules, but which molecules would one use if it can be detected as a signature of advanced intelligent yeah. life? So uh, to answer your first question, they, uh, we have already reported detection of methane, uh, carbon oxide and water. Okay. Basically, those three elements are the most common ones uh, reported right now. And um, and then for the biomarkers, mm -hmm. the more we look into it, the more difficult it's becoming. Because um, back in 1993, Carl Sagan published this mm -hmm. uh, uh, data set from the Galileo probe, mm -hmm. where he saw molecular oxygen and methane that were in very large uh, non-local thermodynamical equilibrium. So mm. the conclusion from those observations was that they were being produced by organisms. Mm. And those two elements alone could be a si like a signature of life. Exactly. And that's what, they what we should be looking for in other planets. Mm. There are a few recent results that um, can, can explain how oxygen forms without having life. Uh, and and this is just 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 because uh, you know the uh, the water molecule gets dissociated, and then mm. the hydrogen gets blown away or not blown away, but you know it, it evaporates okay. basically goes away from the atmosphere and the oxygen builds up. Uh, so right now uh, we are a little bit skeptical to mm. just say if we detect oxygen that's a signature of life. Mm. So what we are thinking right now is that we have to look at different molecules hmm. at the same time and we not only have to detect oxygen but we also have to detect methane hmm. and ozone all together right. and that might tell hmm. you, you right. know, uh, but hmm. the field is actually evolving so quickly that you know I'm telling you this now and you know in a year I might come back and say oh uh, forget about the ozone that one doesn't work either. Okay. I yeah. thought I had that I realize it's very low abundant but chlorofluorocarbons are probably yeah. unique for an advanced civilization. Yeah, some people Maybe are th also thinking of uh, deuterated water. Uh, so there, there, there are a few, but mm. th yeah, the uh, the uh, problem with the uh, the hydro hydrochloro whatever that means. <laughs> 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 Sorry, mm. <laughs> uh, the problem is that the signal of those right, is going to be so variable. tiny Even that fast, our yeah. telescopes are not going to be able to detect them. That's uh, which is a shame, but, but maybe somewhere on the absorption spectrum where nothing else is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> okay. yeah, but it's, it's going to be tricky because the abundance is so low. That right. mm. yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and a uh, fascinating discussion. Uh, I had two questions as well. One is, I just want to be clear on this. I, I completely understand uh, that if a planet is young, let's say in its first billion or two years of existence, mm. there's a lot of geological processes going on. Uh, that maybe could even pump uh, oxygen into the atmosphere of a lifeless planet somehow uh, if it wasn't there to begin with. But when you get up around, say, a planet that's four or five billion years old, are you saying you can imagine a scenario where oxygen O2, as reactive as it is, could continue to exist on a, on a, yeah. uh, on a planet with no biological process? Yeah, it's like uh, th there are, I mean, these, these are in my papers, but there are at least three papers out there now that explain mechanisms by which molecular oxygen could form without the need of life. One okay. of them is uh, by photolysis of water, meaning the water molecule, molecule uh, 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 separates. And then if the planet doesn't have enough uh, sodium and argon in the atmosphere, then the oxygen just remains in the atmosphere oh. because it has no way to recombine and disappear. So even though it's reactive, it has nowhere to go. Right. Okay. So so there isn't a sink where the oxygen goes. I so, see what so you're saying. So it builds up in the atmosphere. Okay. 
And for us, looking at that planet from here, it looks like it has a lot of oxygen, but it doesn't necessarily come from life. I um, understand. So uh, those, those are ideas that are floating around now. And and we, we, we just have to, <coughs> to listen to them. Because well, I appreciate that clarification. Yeah. And yeah. I also had a question, uh, just generally speaking, if you, have a, if you had, imagine you had a solar system with two rocky planets that could be Earth size or super Earth, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, is it fair to say that if one of them is in a close orbit, maybe even like a Mercury orbit, and so its surface temperature is going to be very hot, yeah. and the other one is more in the Goldilocks zone, uh, so the surface temperature is going to be like this room temperature here, that it would be easy. It would be easier for you to to get a more precise spectral analysis of the hotter one, even if the two planets were chemically yeah. similar, just because there's more excitation of the molecules in the atmosphere. There is um, there is a double answer to that question. Okay. Um, the first one, yes, it is easier because the way we look at it is the planet has to go in front of a star. So the closer in planet will go more often, so we will be able to get more, more data. The more data we have, the easier it is for us to detect the atmosphere. Um, the second answer is maybe not, because if the planet is really close, uh, the atmosphere of, of the planet might have been blown away mm. by, by the radiation coming from the star. Although some theorists tell you that the planet might preserve an atmosphere, but it's going to be uh, denser, meaning that only the heavy molecules are going to stay, yes. and the, the lighter you know, molecules or uh, chemical elements are going to be blown away. Okay. Um, so it is a catch-22, because it's easier to collect data for those planets, but maybe the atmospheres have been blown away, so they don't have an atmosphere. Thank you. Oh, sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.